welcome to uh, CFA Level 1. I know that you're probably on the fence about whether you, or not you'd like to uh, uh, take a class with us or, uh, or use our on-demand videos. So what I've done here for a, a few moments is give you sort of an introduction to my teaching style. My name is Nathan Ronan. I'm co-founder of Chalk and Board. And what I'd like to do is give you a few moments to see, okay, if I actually buy Nathan's class or if I buy Na live class or if I buy Nathan's, purchase Nathan's uh, on-demand videos, um, what am I really getting? Okay, hopefully many of you know me already because I've been in the industry for many, many years. Um, actually, in my 22nd year of uh, teaching CFA Level 1, 2, and 3, I am one of the only instructors anywhere that teaches the entire CFA curriculum. So what I wanted to do here is you as a CFA Level 1 candidate, my style of teaching is very different from what you might get from a competitor or from other instructors. And that is that my focus is really geared to you understanding, not memorizing the material. Because the more you understand, the less you memorize, the better you can actually make the step onto applying those concepts to the questions on the CFA exam at any level, not only just level one, but even at level two and level three. And my goal is here that if you're satisfied with the level one product, that you'll be following through and you pass level one, that you'll follow through with me and allow me to be, guide you and be your instructor through level two and level three. Onto the charter. So what I'd like to do is just start out here and say, you know what, in the level one program, one area that sort of uh, confuses many level one candidates is the area of hypothesis testing in the quantitative methods material. How, and the reason why I selected this topic is because you need to understand this topic very well because it repeats itself at level two and then it, they go further with hypothesis testing at level two. So what I have here is if you take a look at this little example, again, this is just a snippet here. You know, we're not gonna do the whole thing, but just a snippet here of how, so you can get a flavor for how I teach. Let's take a look at this example that you have on the screen, okay? And the idea here is, let's say there's, you are a fundamental analyst and your job at your company is to recommend stocks, equities, to your, uh, to your clients. So you do research and you come up with recommendations on buying, selling, or holding specific securities. And you haven't been doing really very well on your stock picks and you're suddenly reading the newspaper one day and when you're reading the newspaper you suddenly see an advertisement by a technical stock selection service company and they make a claim that on their stock picks for the past year they have earned a 15% rate of return on their hundreds and hundreds of stock picks. You believe that in the current market environment earning 15% over a one year period on any stock is kind of like not only unheard of, but it's very difficult to do. So it piques your interest. And what you do is you read a little bit more and you say, you know what? I'm actually very interested in, I think that somehow I could take this research that the technical stock selection service company has and integrate it with my own thinking and my own fundamental analysis in order to improve my stock picks for my customers and hopefully turn around some of the losses that they've been experiencing in their accounts into gains. So as I said, this technical stock selection service company makes a claim that over the last year, on all of their stock picks, they have earned an average annual total return of 15%. So therefore we would say that mu of X, the population mean, which is all of the technical stock selection service company stock picks is 15%. So mu of X uh, would be 15%. However, I would like to buy this research, but in order to do so, I need to get my manager's approval. So I bring him the ad, I show them what this technical stock selection service company has done, and he sits down with me and he says, well, before we write the check to this company blindly, you know what we should do? We should actually take a sample from the stock picks that they made last year and see whether or not, in fact, they do earn a 15% rate of return. In other words, can we, val can we try to help validate their claim? So um, my manager and I, we decide to pick 16 stocks at random. So N is equal to 16. If you look at the screen, you can see that N is equal to 16, okay? So we pick 16 stocks at random, and from this pick of 16 stocks, we calculate the mean return of those 16 stocks, and we didn't get 15% like the technical stock selection service company claimed. We actually only got 11%. And the standard deviation for this one sample of 16 stocks that we took was 9%. So you have all of this information at the top of your screen right now showing you that the population mean is 15, the number of observations is 16, our sample mean X bar was 11%, and the standard deviation of our sample was 9%. Now what we would like to do, what I sort of look at it is I say to my, my, my um, manager, I say, wow, we only got 11%, I guess we should just forego 
uh, subscribing to the technical stock selection service company's research. So sorry to waste your time, boss. And he says to me, nope, Nathan, you see, that's why you're still in a cubicle and I'm in the corner office. See, I understand that from, the, from those hundreds and hundreds of stock picks, I'm kidding, guys, come on. Uh, from the hundreds and hundreds of stock picks, we only selected 16 stocks. And you know what? If we would have selected another 16 stocks, do you think we would have gotten the exact same sample mean, 11%? Probably not. Exactly. So what, what, what we want to know is, is 11% close enough to 15% that any differential, that 4% differential is not statistically significant. I'm not talking about absolute significance, I'm talking about statistical significance. So in other words, is 11% close enough to 15% to that it's statistically insignificant, that differential of 4%, or is 11% statistically significantly different from 15%? So what we do is we, are, we create what is called a null hypothesis, which is on your screen as H sub zero, and then the alternate hypothesis, which is H sub A, okay? So um, what you'll see is that the null hypothesis is that the population mean is equal to 15%, and then the alternate hypothesis we set up as the population mean is not equal to 15%. When we have the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis equal to or not equal to a specific number, a specific integer, like we do in this example, 15%, we call that a two-tailed test because we're going to have rejection in two areas of the distribution, to the right and to the left, in the tails. We're going to have two tails. We can also establish this as a one-tailed test. The way that you know for the purposes of the exam, if it's a two-tailed test or a one-tailed test, is if the null and the alternate hypothesis are equal to or not equal to, that's a two-tailed test because we can have rejection in both sides. The, uh, the, the one-tailed hypothesis test would have a greater than equal, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to sign in either the null or the alternate hypothesis. So to the right side of the screen, you could see that I also established and I could have, I could have established a, a null hypothesis where the population mean is greater than or equal to 15%. And the alternate hypothesis is that the population mean is less than 15%. When there's an inequality, we call that a one tail test because there's going to be rejection only in one tail. But we're, for the purposes of the exam, especially for level one, and even mostly for level two, when you get into level two, is that they do focus on the two-tailed hypothesis test, where there's rejection in two potential areas. So what we now need to do is we need to decide, are we going to accept or are we going to reject the null hypothesis? And this is something that's very important for you as a level one candidate to understand. You always want to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. So you want to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. I always remember it as AA. Alternate hypothesis starts with the letter A, H-A, and then accept the, null, accept the alternate hypothesis. AA, accept the alternate hypothesis, which means you always want to reject the null hypothesis. Why do you want to reject the null hypothesis? You always want to reject the null hypothesis because if you accept the alternate hypothesis, you have found what? significance. You have found a result that is statistically significantly different from what you expected. You found a result that is in the tails. And that's what you always want to do. You, if you always find that your hypothesis test is confirming what you expected, there's no reason to do these hypothesis tests. What you want to find is anything that is statistically significantly different from what you expected. So you want results that are in the tails. In a two-tail test, they would be in one of the two tails. In a one-tail test, they would only be in one tail, the rejection range. So we call the tails the rejection range and the area within the rejection range the acceptance range. And you could see that actually in the bottom side of your screen where I show you the rejection range is in two side, in the two little sides on the right and the left, and the acceptance range is between those two rejection ranges, okay? Now, this is sort of important to understand. So you want to accept the null, you want to accept the alternate hypothesis. You want to reject the, null, reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis. Do we actually reject and accept? Those are, those are harsh terms. With statistics, we don't prove anything. So it's better to say that we fail to accept or we fail to reject, but the exam doesn't really focus on that nomenclature. So if they say, if they do use fail to accept, realize that fail to accept is the same thing as reject, and fail to reject is the same thing as fail to accept, okay? Or excuse me, fail to reject is the same thing as accepting. So I'll say it again just to make sure. So fail to reject is the same thing as accept, 
and fail to accept is the same thing as reject, okay? So I would focus more on accept and reject and not worry about fail to reject and fail to accept. Once in a blue moon on the exam, they'll use that terminology, but it's very infrequent. So it's either accept or reject the null hypothesis. And again, what do we want to do? We always want to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis because then we find a result that is statistically significantly different from what we expected. In other words, we want to find that 11% is statistically significantly different from 15%. That's what we would want to do. So how do we actually determine whether we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis? There's three tests that you are required to understand in the level one program. And this will repeat again in the level two program. You can, either, either one of these three tests will give you the same conclusion. They will corroborate each other. So whether you do test number one or test number two or test number three, they will all give you the same answer in terms of whether you're gonna reject or accept the null hypothesis. I'll just do for a few mo for a few seconds test number one. Test number one is called the T distribution or the T test or the student T distribution. So it's called the T test and it's based on the student T distribution. Now, what you will un what what you need to understand here is that when you do test number one, you're going to compare your calculated T with your critical T and you need to know where to get your calculated T from and where to get your critical T from, okay? And we say that if the calculated T is less than or equal to the critical T on an absolute value basis, because we don't care if it's negative or not, we will accept the null hypothesis, and if the calculated or computed T is greater than the critical T, then we would reject the null hypothesis. So you might say, well, Nathan, where do we get the calculated T and where do we get the critical T? Well. Let's talk about the critical T and then we'll talk about the calculated T. Now again, what is a T distribution? A T distribution is very similar to a normal distribution, to the normal Z distribution, but it has degrees of freedom because we're taking a sample. When do we use the Z distribution, also known as the standard normal distribution, and when do we use the T distribution? Here's the bottom line. If the population variance is known, bottom line, if the population variance is known, you use the sta standard normal distribution, you use the Z distribution. There's no degrees of freedom. However, if the population variance is unknown, we, need, we cannot use the T, we don't use necessarily the Z distribution, but we need to know if the sample size is large or small. So if the population variance is, is unknown and the sample size is very small, we use the T distribution. In this case, in this example, in this example that I just did, did we know the population variance? No, we didn't. We had the sample, if you will, standard deviation, but we did not have the population variance. So the population variance was unknown. So immediately we say we can't, we might not be able, we might not be able to use the Z distribution. So then we have to say, okay, is the sample size large or small? According to your readings, anytime the sample size is over 30 or 40 observations, it's considered to be a large sample. But in this case, because we only had 16 observations, n was equal to 16, it's a small sample size. So when the population variance is unknown and the sample size is small, less than 30 or 40 observations, we use the T distribution with its degrees of freedom. If the population variance is unknown and the sample size is very large, meaning more than 30 or 40 observations, we could use either the T distribution or the Z distribution because the T distribution, as the sample size gets larger and larger and larger, will converge and it will become the Z distribution. So bottom line is, if what I would remember is population variance known, you use the Z distribution. Population variance is unknown and the sample size is small, T distribution. That's what I would pretty much focus on. So in this case, we would have to use the T distribution. And again, we'd have to compare the critical T with the calculated T. Very quickly, where do we get the critical T? The critical T we would get from the student T table, okay, the student T table or the rule of thumb. What is the rule of thumb and what is the student T distribution table? The rule of thumb, and you'll see that I have there one standard deviation, two standard deviations, or three standard deviations, and I circle them, it's gonna have a value of one, two, or three, depending on the confidence interval. If they tell you that you're using a 95% confidence interval, which means a 5% level of significance. A 95% confidence interval means that you're approximately, approximately two standard deviations away from the mean. So you would use the number two as your critical T. Okay. Now you might be asking yourself or wanting to ask me, Nathan, what exactly is a T value? When you get two or 2.03 or 2.04, what does that mean? A T value 
is how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So think of it as a standard deviation concept. A T value is how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So if the critical T value is 2.02, that means you are 2.02 standard deviations away from the mean. So coming back to the critical T value, we could use the rule of thumb and we would assume that it's two as a rule of thumb if we were not given the student T distribution. Or we could look up the student T, the, the T value to be more precise on the student T table that is given to you as part of the exam. And if we did that with N minus one degrees of freedom, 16 minus one is 15, 15 degrees of freedom with two rejection ranges. So the 5% level of significance is spread out between two areas. So that's 2.5% in each tail. 2.5% in the right tail and 2.5% in the left tail because we have a two tail test. If we look this up on our student T table, we would get a value of 2.131. As you can see on your screen right now, 2.131. This is almost, uh, I've had to bring the screen down a little bit so you could see it, so that you could see 2.131. So that would be our critical T value. What's the difference between two and 2.131? About 0.131. What's, a diff what's, one, what's 0.131 among friends? Nothing. So basically what I'm trying to show you is that there's two ways to come up with the critical T value, an approximation or rule of thumb based on the confidence interval, in this case, two standard deviations away from the mean, or a more precise number by looking it up on the student T table. On the exam, if they give you the student T table, you actually look it up. If not, you could use the rule of thumb. And then on the calculated T, there's two ways that you can come up with the computed T or the calculated T. As you can see on the screen, it says one of them is given, it's given to you. And the second one is a formula, okay? And the formula for the calculated T, which you do need to know is, you take the point estimate, which is the sample mean in this case. You subtract the hypothesized value, which in this case is the hypothesis test, which is the population mean. And then you divide it by the standard error of the sample mean. Not the standard deviation of our one sample, the standard error of the sample mean. Notice that that's S of X bar, not S of X. S of X, as earlier shown, was 9%. S of X bar is different. This is the standard error of all the possible sample means that we could get of 16 observations. Okay. Now, not to go on and drone on about this and on about this, um, when you take a class with me, this is pretty much how I present the materials. I try to do this in a fashion that will, after you've read them, after, you, after you've read the prep providers materials or you've read the uh, curriculum materials that you can actually understand and see how all of this material gets synthesized because the hypothesis testing in the curriculum is hodge, it's a hodgepodge of information among multiple readings. I try to bring the readings to life, bring them together and show you with one comprehensive example like I'm doing now, how are the three different ways that you can decide whether to accept or reject the null hypothesis, what it means and why you want to do it. So I'm going to stop here because I don't want to give away the house okay, for free, but this is pretty much how I uh, try to uh, help candidates pass the level one exam, and I've been successfully doing this for 22 years. Um, I did receive my charter back in 1996, and I hope that you will work with me and allow me to get you through level one, then on to level two, and through level three, and on to your charter. Thank you very much for paying attention, and if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. You can, you can either contact me on my email address that's given to you, or if you will, my phone number. I'm happy to help you out either way. Thank you for listening.